Welcome back to John's Films. I see a PC and I wonder, could that run DaVinci Resolve? Well, today I'm building two back-to-school PCs. One of them, beautiful pink case. And the question I've got, can it run Resolve? Let's find out. For my DaVinci Resolve friends, I'm going to give you the benchmarks first, and then I'll show you how to build one of these fantastic machines. The magic question, what's in one of these? Well, the first configuration I test of the back-to-school PC is a Ryzen 3400G APU. This means it's got the CPU and the GPU covered in the one chip. It's on a Gigabyte B450M Wi-Fi motherboard, and it's got 16 gigabytes of Teen Group 3200MHz DDR4 because it's so cheap right now. RAM. Cheap. 1TB SSD, and the one that I'm benchmarking is in the Lian Li Landcool 1, but I also build one in a Dark Flash V22 pink case. Only a little bit changes in the second config. I add an AMD RX 580 8GB GPU. The idea was keep the price down and see how far and how much improvement we can get in Resolve stepping up from the Ryzen 3400G GPU only. Let's take a look at the performance results. Here it is with the base, no RX 580, and here it is with the RX 580. You can see a 393, to put that in perspective, uh, a modern PC, 37, 3900 X with, uh, say, a 2070 Super is around 900 in the score range, and, and a 3950 plus 2080 Ti is somewhere around 11, 1200. So this is really going to be a rough performance, but we can quantify it even further. Let's go straight to where I think most people using this machine would film, which is on their cell phone, which is an H.264 codec, most likely. And you can see that even raw playback without the GPU is 7.55 frames per second. With it, you get a little bit more. That's 23.9. This is in, uh, by the way, free edition of DaVinci Resolve. And the second you add anything to it, though, uh, on both ends, you get the pain. So I would not recommend this as an editing platform, really, for anything. I imagine if you could throw a 1070 or maybe a 2070, 2060 in here, you'd see this jump up to around 500, uh, which maybe that's editable for you. It would be close. Uh, the challenge with that is you're now way outpricing your CPU with now a GPU that's going to cost about as much as your entire system. So it's a tough call. I wouldn't necessarily recommend either of these for video editing, but for schoolwork and Minecraft, this machine's a killer. Now, let's learn how to build this thing. So these two PCs are being built specifically for going back to school. They will be able to play Minecraft, Roblox, whatnot, but more importantly, they can handle the Zoom requirements of working remotely. They can also handle IXL and Khan Academy and everything else that the school system might throw their way. So let's talk about the components. Both of them are getting the B450-Wi-Fi motherboard. Uh, this one is a B450 chipset. We're not looking for an X570 right now. It's not like we're going to overclock these Ryzen 3400G processors which, with the graphics in them, actually can run, based on benchmarks I've seen, Minecraft over 150 frames per second. Same thing for Roblox, which is perfect. That's what they're trying to do. One of them is a budding video editor. And so it was important to me that while now we keep the cost down, if she really gets into video editing, she's able to use the four-core eight-thread processor here and then uh, put an extra graphics card in it. So both of the cases, in both cases, will yeah, I said that. Both of the cases will be able to support an extra graphic card if we add it in. And that's the same reason that we went with a larger than needed power supply. It's a 750 watt, I think was the deal on this one, 700 watt power supply. And uh, this allows us to throw in a graphics card later. Uh, maybe one of those new NVIDIA 3000 newfangled thingies. Uh, beyond that for RAM, they've got uh, 16 gigabytes just to be sure, given the video editing and the uh, budding gamer that's there, in case we end up with that route, and then uh, each of them get a solid state drive. One of the cases is the Pink Excitement. The other one is the Lian Li first generation Land Cool. Done, I'm ready to build. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is prep our motherboard. Prepping the motherboard really just involves taking it out of the box and putting it right back on top of the box. 
simple base motherboard uh, mini ATX form factor. You can see it came with some SATA cables. I think there's probably a manual under here. Yeah, there's, uh, there we go, faceplate manual and the Wi-Fi uh, antennas. If you don't have a clean build service, you know it's static free like I've got right here, then just build on top of the motherboard there. I'm going to take the opportunity to put the CPU in now while it's nice and easy, fully accessible. Uh, and then I will probably snap the RAM in as well. And after that, I'll be ready to go with the case. We're using the integrated cooler. Why? Um, it's adequate, gets the job done, and it's already paid for. Sadly, no RGB, but uh, it's actually a pretty hefty cooler. Comes with thermal paste applied on it. Don't add your own. Like you've seen in so many build videos so far, pull the CPU out. Don't touch the pins on the bottom. Don't drop it. You don't want those bent. Look for the little gold uh, leaf there on the corner, and then align it with the socket for the edge with the uh, triangle indention on the socket. If you've got the motherboard facing you right side down with the PCIe slot sliding across the bottom, it's typically going to be the top left corner. Notice I just dropped it on there. Uh, it appears to have socketed in there, but I'm just going to take the sides and kind of gently wiggle it and see if it is in fact dropped in there. It has. So now I will drop the latch. With this simple back-to-school cool, uh, cooler setup, the smaller one that comes with it, you won't likely have any RAM clearance problems, but we want to make sure you've got four slots that hold the memory. You want to make sure you put it in the right two slots because what we're dealing with here is dual-channel memory. And so to make sure that we get that right, I'm just going to pull the manual out. Ooh, a driver disc. I haven't seen those in a while. To install these, just make sure that both of the clamps on either side are open that you align the notch that's in the middle of the ram stick and that you socket both ends down. Once you're certain that you've got the right alignment of the notch, boom, just drop it on in there. Push down, the latches will self-close and you are in business. Our motherboard comes with pre-installed retention clips for the CPU cooler. Most coolers, aftermarket especially, <coughs> uh, most coolers would use the two hooks that are exposed by it. However, this cooler is a screw-in cooler specifically aligned to screw into the back plate that's already installed. So make sure that you have the motherboard on a secure surface. And you'll see what I'm doing is just unscrewing the four screws that are currently in the back plate, releasing the retention mechanism that we won't be using. Tighten it down until each of the springs feels like they are uh, engaged and creating that resistance because you do want a solid seal on this but you by no means have to drive it all the way down into the bottom and there we go so now we've got our CPU and our RAM installed we do have this hanging dangle of a fan and you look at the motherboard right here if you're using this motherboard up in the top right you'll notice a CPU fan header and you just align the four pins of the header with the four pins on the fan control and boom slide it in you are done now it's time for us to get involved with this pink case. Can't wait. Important to note, you should save the retention mechanism that was here because if you ever decide to put an aftermarket cooler on it, you're gonna be really happy you did. The best place to do that is the motherboard box. It's a size you won't really lose it too easily and it also will hold everything that you're gonna need to put in here. Now I gotta tell you, I've not been exactly excited about building in this thing. Uh, it has nothing to do with the color. This is one of the cheaper cases that just gets stamped out over and over again. It's got a lot of sharp edges on the inside of it. It's got a, a very little cable pass through and management. It's just going to be a pain to build in. So let's get to it. I'm impressed. That was pretty nice. So it has a thumb screwless uh, release there on the glass panel. Big picture drawings. Nice. And now we need to find all of the thumb screws. Okay, it's better. Need to find all of the screws and uh, attachments that are in here. 
I do also see that the standoffs for the motherboard are pre-installed. That's nice. Maybe I was complaining for no good reason. We'll find out. You can see they've bundled up all of the cable connectors. And what I'm doing now is pulling that baggie off. The baggie is all the screws and everything that goes with uh, the PC here. You'll find everything that you need uh, to build, including screws that go into the motherboard and all that business, typically with the case. Uh, don't know how motherboard and case manufacturers decided this, but uh, the case guys get screwed because they have to provide. Oh, good. They gave us tweezers. Thanks, Verge. Seriously, though, those cable ties may come in handy. Um, and then here's all the screws that we're going to need to be able to build the machine. I'm going to take the opportunity to flip this thing on its side, making sure I don't lose any of those goodies. And that I don't pinch all these cables in the process. Stash, stash them down in the power supply. Okay, so let me show you what we got in here. What we've got is a bunch of standoffs that are pre-applied. These are these nubs that are sticking up. And effectively, we will be placing the motherboard directly over those. The motherboard has some pre-built holes in it that we're going to align with the nubs. We'll screw a screw through the motherboard into the nub, and that will hold the motherboard up uh, maybe half an inch over the metal here because we don't want all of the metal traces on the bottom of the motherboard here to short against the case. All right, I'll be right back. If you have one of the less expensive motherboards, you probably have one of these. This is an I.O. shield that you need to make sure from the inside of the case to pop into the back plate area. Um, you're going to want to align the cutouts with the way that the motherboard is organized. From the inside of the case, I push the I.O. shield through and now I am aligning the motherboard specifically so that all of the alignment tabs go directly into it. and. That's aligned, and when that is aligned, you should be directly over some of those nubs with the holes aligned specifically where you need them to go. And now it's just a matter of getting your regular old screwdriver and installing it. Now, I was bagging on the case earlier, but so far it has provided absolutely everything pre-installed. Uh, pre-installed standoffs. We've got all the cabling in there, the screws. I even have some extra standoffs here in case I need them. Now that we've got the process of the motherboard and the memory installed, uh, not too much more to do. We plug in the power supply and uh, wire it up. And we press the button and hope. As it's a value build, you notice we do not have a modular power supply. Still a high quality supply. Uh, it's just, you know, you, you lose some of the niceties. As it's a value build, we do have a non-modular power supply, which means all the cables are already attached. It's a little bit of an annoyance, but honestly, no big deal, and it is a high-quality 80-plus gold power supply. All right, so I'm going to strategize here on how the power supply is going into the case. You'll notice there's a fan on one side. We want that fan exhausting out of the case, and the way that it'll work, it'll either draw in and push the air out here or suck the air in and push out. And because of that, I don't want to blow that warmer air back into the case. So, in this case, the case has a vent on the bottom and I'll align the power supply so that it's pushing the air out the vent. In terms of power cables to connect, we have here the 24 pin power adapter. And that is gonna come through one of these holes up at the front, wrap around and clip into, Woo, look at those cables, mustard. There we go, that socketed in there. When somebody's building a computer, they talk about ketchup and mustard, they're talking about these cables. You can see the uh, rainbow array of power cables. Uh, one hack would be to just wrap this in black electrical tape. It's gonna look better, and that's likely what I'll do here. Um, the other thing to do would be to buy a cable extension, which would plug into your cable and then provide a better look coming around the front of the case. In this case, it's just going to be black electrical tape, make things easy. All right, now we need to make sure we get uh, these more modern motherboards. We'll have a secondary power connector up here. You can see my finger coming through. And it's going to have a CPU cable, which is often labeled CPU, to ensure you grab the right one. 
power to the motherboard achieved. We have no external components other than our hard drive, which we need to install here. Got the hard drive here. It's amazing what they can fit. This is a terabyte stuck directly onto a two and a half inch hard drive. Uh, not any, not even close to what they can really do to compress that data down, but hey, it's pretty awesome that it's all in this little package for me to install. And now all I need to do is screw it into the case with the, the four. Um, this thing calls itself a luxury case, actually, in all the materials. But um, one of the things that's missing I wish it had was a drive sled that I would screw this into and then I just snap the, the drive in it. So we need to connect power to that SATA drive. We'll also have to connect a uh, data connector to the motherboard. The power is going to be in the form of one of these slimmer SATA power. There we go. Usually daisy chained, in this case daisy chained with the Molex connector. Old school. I'm not hating that. The case did an okay job of making sure I had what I needed. You need the SATA connector that came with the motherboard. So here we've got uh, two SATA cables that came with the motherboard. One of them is flat, so it's got two straight connectors. One of them has a, a straight connector and a 90 degree bend. I'm going to be using the flat flat because while typically you would use the 90 degree bend to come out of a cable pass through and into the side here, this motherboard has all of the SATA connectors directly, you can see here, facing out this way on the motherboard instead of folded back this way. So, I find the connection down at the bottom, pass this through, make sure the cable is aligned in the right direction. There we go, SATA connected there, and now SATA connected here. There we go. Really not terrible. Now it's time for us to plug in all of these auxiliary cables that come off the case. This case has one USB 3, two USB 2, and then some audio. We'll start with the audio. It says HD audio on it. And this one is gonna have to go, typically, the sound card on the motherboard is in the back corner back here, so it typically has to come through there. Let's see where it is. It has a missing pin hole on it, and then you align the missing pin hole with the pins that are out on the board, and you've got uh, connection. The big blue one here, this is USB 3.0. It's also blue on the inside of the port. You're going to want to use this one whenever you can, um, especially uh, presuming you have USB 3. Peripherals. On the motherboard, it's a larger socket than the other USB connectors, and it typically says USB 3.0 right in the bottom, as this one does. It has a notch on the top of that connector that you will align the notch, and it'll clip in just like that. Now it comes down to the fun ones. Uh, we have the USB, that's not too bad. So this is the USB 2. This is for the two ports I've got of USB up here. Again, I'll feed it through the bottom. And you'll see on your motherboard, um, eight pin headers, many of them rolling across. They'll have a blocked out area. These white headers at the bottom are all of them in this motherboard. I'll line again the, the notched out hole. This one is different pin out than the HD audio, which is fortunate. I imagine people try and slam that one in there. Be a bad plan. Now you've got left this a sundry... Well, it's annoying. One of the things you need to do now is figure out each of these says something on them. This one says reset switch. I've got a power switch, I've got an HD LED, that's the hard drive, and then I got a power LED, plus and minus, that's for the light up to tell you if the computer's on or off. For this, you need to use the motherboard manual. And the motherboard manual, as brief as it may be in this case, should tell you what the pinout is on the motherboard. Okay, I've just found that pinout description. It looks like I need to go back to writing assembly code like I did in college because it's all in abbreviations. Let's hope I get this right. As I recall, the hard drive Oh man, so we will run it, run it through the bottom here because it's the closest access point. You will learn to hate this part of computer building. Next is the reset switch on the bottom next to it. You know what I really always hate? So notice these are all two, two, and they're bound together. For some reason, every time <laughs> the power switch 
or the, the power LED. Not the hard drive LED, not anything else, but it comes in two one little things. Now really it's all about uh, making the back, the back of this case as acceptable as possible. You notice currently it's a hot mess, so what do we do? Uh, not too much you can do. Um, typically you would hope that none of this would be here because you'd be using a modular power supply. We are not today. Now some of you are going to say, just get a lav mic. Um, I do, except for what happens is when I bend over something like this and the, the lav mic gets shielded, it's um, worse. This one I can also directionally keep away from the air conditioner back there. Like I was saying earlier, it's a hundred and something degrees in Texas today. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to burn up just for you guys to hear clearer. Not going to happen. Alright, so all of these just need to be bound up and put in the bottom. Plenty of these little twisty ties came with this setup, so I will use those. And I'm going to tie up as many of these together as I can so it's a nice, neat little bundle. Oh, if anybody needs it, they'll really hate me when they have to go back in and... Hey, wait a minute. As it turns out, I'm probably the guy that's going to have to come back in here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Fun stuff. Now, I specifically didn't tell the parents to order any fans because I've got a ton of these uh, random black fans. And they're actually quite nice. Some of them are the Intermax, based on my old Lictec 2 uh, arguments that I was having. Went through several of these coolers for the original TR4 uh, Threadripper machine. And these are really nice, quiet. Uh, Intermax can't make a liquid cooler to save its life, in my opinion. But uh, they make a heck of a fan. So, good news. We're going to be able to put some of those into this build. You can see we have a completely closed-off front panel. And the only airflow, honestly, doesn't come in the side here. Putting any fans up here is actually useless. There's no separation here. Shows you where you could mount some fans, but uh, at this point you could mount fans here. You wouldn't get very far. Uh, so what I'm going to do, it looks like I can probably pull air in through the top and push it out the back. So I'll pull the air in with the fan here and one to push the air out there and call it good. On the motherboard you're going to connect this uh, four pin power connector to a motherboard header specifically to control the fans. Then you would use software in either the BIOS or Gigabyte will have a download utility that you can use to control the fans relative to the temperature of different sensors on the motherboard or the processor. We've got one in. Notice when I did this, I made sure to put the cable connecting in the back corner. That way I can route this out the back of the case and you'll never know it was there. So I'm going to go out the nearest hole and now I'm going to find out where the headers are on the motherboard and I'll come back through. This is what helps us keep this clean up here. There you go. So now we've got this aligned so the air comes in here and then comes back out here. Uh, that should be enough airflow for the case. Really, there's not going to be too much heat generated out of this considering we're looking at a 3400G APU and no GPU. Do have these fan cables I need to plug in and I want to put them into a splitter, so let me find the splitter. I'll be right back. Here we are in the magic magic bucket of fans, vertical GPU mounts, and other various connectors. All right. So, unfortunately, something I don't like here, you'll notice <laughs> it splits right at the base. And I have a challenge because the only other fan header in here is the system fan header right here. The worst spot on the motherboard it could be to have two giant connectors coming off of it. But I don't really have an option. So I'm going to make the best of the situation, plug that in, and then try and route these up here so that they aren't in the way of the fan or that visible. And I will bring both of the fan connectors in here. So now it's time for quality control check before we boot. We want to make sure we've got everything connected. We do have a hard drive here. I'm going to validate that, sure enough, power and SATA connection to the motherboard are there. Let's terminate that SATA connection down here. This is USB 3 for the USB 3 up front. Okay, USB 2, that's going to be here. HD audio is there. I've got two fans routed up. Both of those fans are connected to the motherboard in the SIS fan. A header which we'll need to remember. We have 
Our CPU fan is connected. That's probably one of the most important to make sure we keep our CPU cool. And we are ready for a test boot. So here we are. We fully built this thing. It is running and it's clean. Wouldn't say it's the best thing for DaVinci Resolve, but it will boot. So uh, we'll see what she thinks. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go build the Landcool 1 base system. It's all the same parts, all the same connectors. If this has been really helpful for you, please feel free to buy me a coffee in the link below. Otherwise, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. I'd love to have you come back and learn more about DaVinci Resolve. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.